Hello and welcome to Quartic Training. Alternative investment. This is a subject that has changed a lot since it first came into level two just a few years ago. It has grown a little bit. This year it has probably shrunk a little bit since last year. It is five to fifteen percent, which means one to three questions. In practice, probably just one question. As you'll see, this is not a long section. I said it has grown. About three years ago it wasn't in the curriculum. It came in as half of a study session, then it became a whole study session. Uh, and it reached six readings last year. So if you have seen this before or you've got access to out-of-date books, then let's go through the chapters. Of the four chapters, the first two are pretty tiny. They are on real estate and they are unchanged since last year. So investment analysis and income property analysis, both pretty short chapters. Private equity valuation, that was new l last year, 2011. Uh, so we revisit that, though you'll be uh, actually, it might have been a few years ago, uh, but you will be disappointed to hear that the complicated chat, the complicated appendix at the end has been simplified enormously, so not so much work there. And then finally, hedge funds. This replaces two chapters from last year on hedge funds, which were both pretty small, uh, and even though there was a tough exam question on them, uh, this is now a more unified approach. So we've got a survey of hedge funds that so will come to that at the end. The other chapter that's gone is commodities, so because that's now covered at level one. So we've got two little chapters on property, one on private equity, and one on hedge funds. Let's begin with investment analysis. So this is all about property. We start off by looking at how we can invest in property. I'm not going to go through every detail on this slide. It is purely factual. But you should try and think through what makes the characteristics and the risks and the investors who they are. And if you think about what the property is and whether it's generating income and whether it's creating lots of depreciation and so on, uh, you should be able to work a lot of this out. Uh, so raw land, for example. Uh, raw land, it is passive. It doesn't generate any income. Uh, it's going to be neutral on cash in that there's no income from it, therefore not much tax. There might be a wealth tax to pay on it, but nothing else uh, until sale. Uh, if you have apartments, then you've got, obviously that's relating to the population, reasonable liquidity, quite high gearing, because if you've got a, generally speaking, you can get high gearing if you've got a good steady income. So raw land, for example, you're not going to be able to borrow much to buy land because there's no income to secure in order to get your, in order to secure interest payments. But apartments, you are getting, you can generate gearing, so leverage, and that, therefore that's going to give you a reasonable income, taxable certainly. Office buildings, also reasonable liquidity. You can generate gearing on that, though if you've been sort of following the news during the credit crunch, commercial property is no longer able, you can't have anything like as high level of gearing for commercial properties you can with residential. Um, so gearing is sort of moderate here. Uh, there is a rental income and you get capital appreciation if you find the market. Warehousing, so medium liquidity again, medium leverage. Uh, you're going to get rental income. Uh, sometimes there's going to be oversupply and obsolescence. I suppose it depends on where you are. Shopping centers also depends on population and where it is. Reasonably active. Fairly low liquidity that you're not going to be able to buy and sell shopping centers quickly. These are fairly massive transactions that were going to be reported in the national press. Uh, medium gearing, but you get good return, so you can borrow on that. Uh, the risk is a vacancy rate. We all see stories of shopping centers that are half empty in parts of the world that are uh, suffering economically, and that's obviously a risk for the owners. A risk of obsolescence, look at shopping centers that are 20 or 30 years old, and you feel that they are just a little bit uh, tired and they need um, a fairly massive overhaul. So quite a big obsolescence, obsolescence risk there. Uh, hotels, motels, of course the location is everything. Not so much liquidity because they're such large and indivisible properties. Uh, fairly low gearing. Um, and you're relying on good management and having a good competitive advantage uh, in the, town, the part of the town that the hotel is operated in. What we're going to look at is evaluation of a property using principles we've seen in corporate finance. This Greek lambda should be a dot, dot, dot. And we're going to be valuing property 
in using techniques, not, nothing new, or only a few, a few concepts here are going to be new. So we're going to be looking at net present value and internal rate of return. And the NPV, we're going to be looking at net cash flows. So it's going to be cash flows after tax, CFAT. Cash flows after tax, suitably discounted. So IAT is our suitable risk adjusted return. So it's something along the lines of our WAC. And then at the end, we have our ERAT, the equity reversion after taxes. Uh, so the, when we're working out the ERAT, then we are going to need to think about capital gains tax. We're going to need to be thinking, thinking about paying off the mortgage and any other closing cash flows that arise on sale of a property. We then subtract EI, so the equity investment. All that means is that means CF0. So we're paying out the amount at the beginning. Again, with EI, the initial equity investment, you must be considering that the cash flow is net of the mortgage. So it's going to be the amount that we invest ourselves rather than the cost of the property. As we have seen before, the net present value gives a more realistic view than the IRR. Um, we've seen other issues relating to multiple IRRs, etc. Um, here is a new concept that you uh, may not have seen before, which is the idea of different rates of tax. If you imagine a property, very few properties are not depreciated. Uh, some properties are built to last for millennia, but not many. Uh, most properties, certainly from a commercial perspective, are built to last for a certain period of time, maybe 50 years, maybe even 100 years, and they will be depreciated over that period. Now, if you recall from corporate finance, when we have depreciated a property, then on sale, if you sell the property at its book value for tax purposes, what we called at level one, the tax base, then there's no tax because there's no gain or loss on disposal. But if we sell it at a price higher or lower than its tax base, then there will be a tax liability. So let's go through this example because what we're showing here is two different tax rates. One is what happens if we sell it between the book value and the purchase price. In other words, the, we may have over-depreciated it. Remember, when you depreciate it, your depreciation gives you a charge against taxable income. And so if you sell it above your book value, it means you over-depreciated, you took too much tax benefit during its life, and therefore you'll be paying a tax on the profit there. And then if you sell it at a capital gain, at a price higher than the purchase price, uh, you'll be making a, an additional chargeable profit, which is the capital gain. Let's do an example here. Purchase price of 1 million, accumulated depreciation of 200,000. So this is 1 million, and we've depreciated it down to 0.8 million. We're going to look at three different selling prices, and we've got two tax rates, 30% on recapture depreciation, 25% on capital gains. Our three scenarios are as follows. First of all, 700,000. So 700,000 is down here. We have a tax loss. So the sales price, we have a tax loss, and therefore, because 700,000 is less than 800,000, and therefore there is no tax to pay. Now, in reality, what would happen is uh, that would cause a $100,000 loss that could be used elsewhere. So that would, in fact, reduce your taxes. But for the purposes of this uh, learning outcome statement, we just ignore that and say this doesn't generate any tax liability. Now, although we appreciate that tax losses do generate a cash flow advantage because we're all going to get tax back on that. Uh, the concept of recapture depreciation is described in just a very brief example, one of the examples in the reading. Uh, if you have your curriculum, it is on page 2122. Um, and in that example, it just talks about a sale, in fact, at a capital gain, which will be our example three here. Uh, so we need not worry about any issues on tax losses. Uh, let's look at the second example, 950. So 950 is where we have made a capital loss, but we're still showing recaptured depreciation. So we're showing a profit on sale because we're selling it above the book value, but it, it's still below what we purchased it at. So we're showing a gain of 950. 